So once again, on a private ranch in South Texas in Hidalgo County. Actually, I believe we're in Star County now. But regardless, you can see from the soil, it's very dry. And they normally get a little bit more rain here uh, in, uh, in this part of Texas in the summer. But, you know, we're again, it hasn't rained in a while. And then furthermore, we're at about 26 degrees latitude north here. So even if they get rain, it's so goddamn hot during the day that it dries out to a bone within a few days. But, uh, you know, it's fine because all the plants that grow here uh, have been here for tens, if not hundreds of thousands of years, and they, they're more than adapted uh, to this uh, kind of habitat. Take, for instance, the prosopis, uh, the, the mesquite. Take, for instance, the, uh, well, now it's Senegalia. It's Senegalia berlandieri, another wonderful fabaceae. And, of course, this uh, Celtis and the Cannabaceae, of course, a big relative of weed over there. Uh, this is a Hackberry, the Celtis, and the berries that these are, are edible. But uh, uh, And then, of course, even more so adapted uh, to this, uh, this harsh, very dry and hot uh, climate are plants like this, this extremely rare, possibly one of the most rare cacti uh, in the United States and probably all of North America, Astrophytum asterius. So again, you can see that soil is just completely bone dry. And this, uh, this cactus, you know, as well as producing alkaloids uh, that, uh, you know, they're not going to make a human trip. They're not like uh, the peyote that's over there. <clears throat> but uh, they, will, they will make you throw up if you eat them. They're not going to give you that, uh, that high that some people like, of course. But they will, again, make you vomit. And that's one of the defense mechanisms that this plant has uh, in addition to being able to recede into the soil, to just recess into the soil like that, since it does lack spines. Now this plant is extremely rare, mostly due to habitat loss. Uh, it's very common in cultivation. The Japanese have done wonders over there uh, in their greenhouses cultivating this bastard. They got all different types of, types of cultivars and what the shit going on. But uh, again, in habitat, it's just loose in ground. And again, I think a few of them uh, on other parts of this property uh, have even died out, according to the wonderful woman uh, who's allowing us to be here. Uh, there again, you can see that wonderful ground lichen. Now, I was here in January, and this whole area was just covered in little blotches of that green snot, that cyanobacterial film Nostoc communis, uh, and it was just, you know, a much different thing going on. Muddy, wet, uh, just lichen just lit up all over the ground. This lichen was photosynthetically active and doing its thing. It's actually dormant now. Remember, lichens are, of course, a symbiosis between a, a, a algae and a fungi. Uh, you got your Corophantha macromeris over there with those prominent tubercles. You got some Echinocereus and Eucanthus. And then, of course, over here, uh, you got the, your old friend, uh, Grandpa Peyote, uh, Lophophora williamsii. So again, you could tell. See, there's all this, all this stuff that's all basically algae that is dormant now because it's so and there's the lichen so you got algae and lichens that are dormant now because it's again it's it's hot as balls it's very uh, unpleasant i've been in this uh, type of uh, atmosphere habitat brutal fucking summer heat for about the past three weeks you know and i, I can attest to the fact that it's it's uh, it, it's enough to drive one mad you actually kind of just you just get used to it your body just becomes a, like a non-stop uh uh, your own AC unit, your own swamp cooler, you know. You just got to make sure you don't get the swamp ass as well. You, know, you got to just take proper hygiene and what this shit, uh, which can be hard when you're living in a truck, but that's what Starbucks bathrooms are for. Anyway, look at this beautiful Lofafra Williamsii. You can see over there some of the conejos, some of the little rabbits have been gnawing on it. Uh, yeah, I wonder how that made them feel, you know. It doesn't, I mean, the whole reason that these things make human beings, quote, trip is because they possess alkaloids that will make rabbits throw up. It's to, you know, uh, deter things from gnawing on them. There's some real big ones over there. You got the, some much larger ones. Again, that Corophantha macromeris. And when I was here, you know, when I was here uh, back a couple months ago, back in January, there was a really rare one, a kind of serious Poselga, right? Oh, I see it right now. I see it actually right now. True that fucking, that's such a lovely cactus. If I can actually get the camera to focus over there. You see that little guy? See that white little thing? Looks like a stick. See that? 
We'll go over there in a minute and I'll show it to you. That's one of the coolest goddamn Echinoceros, in my opinion, that exists. Here's that Coryphantha with a big ass uh, loaf just growing out of it. Got more loafs over there. Now, again, I don't understand why people poach these things because they're so incredibly easy to grow from seed. Now, I don't encourage doing that, of course, because they're illegal to possess. But if you wanted to, what you would do is order seed from a company in Scotland or any of the other online marketeers of the tiny black poppy seed resembling uh, embryos. And then you would, uh, you know, of course, get those in a mail and you would just grow them in a little, you know, I, I guess it's mineral organic soil like you would germinate most cacti. And I've grown a lot of cacti from seed, not this one, but many. And, uh, and then you would, of course, just put a nice saran wrap over the top, keep the humidity up. You could even grow it on one of those humidity domes with the LED lights. That's how I root a lot of cuttings. That's how I, uh, you know, I actually, you know, somebody just told me they got the Xanthocyparis vietnamensis, the very rare conifer, and I'm planning on rooting about 40 of those and then distributing them mostly to arboretums of botanic gardens for ex situ conservation purposes because that cypress is endangered in habitat and runs the risk of uh, going into, uh, you know, extinction. Uh, regardless, I digress. You know, they're extremely easy to grow. There's no reason to destroy habitat and poach this or that other astrophytum that's growing over there. No reason at all, you know. Please, don't be a jag. Don't be a, don't be a prick. Don't be selfish, okay? Do not take any of these from habitat, okay? And it does, in that case, that's one of the good things about Texas is that should you go onto someone's land and try to take these, you do run the risk of uh, getting shot. And in many cases, if you're one person to do that kind of thing, uh, I would hope that you do. Uh, though I'm not normally in the business of wishing ill upon people, I do, you know, humanity's got such a massive footprint right now uh, and ecosystems everywhere are taking hit. You got 8 billion fucking people, the tumor's growing, the tumor's ripe. Don't fuck with habitat. Anyway, here's this nice uh, clumping form and now I, it's hard to really tell if these are all the same clone or it looks like there's a pup coming off of one they do pup when the above ground tissue is damaged the 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 plants will produce offsets but again uh, when they do produce fruits and the fruit the fruits look like a nice little pink chili pepper the chili pepper has you know so many little black poppy seeds in it and what they do you know if an animal doesn't get to it and the animal's attracted to that bright pink fruit and then drags it off and in doing so disperses some of the, the tiny black seeds because what the animal's really going for is that pink fleshy stuff that composes the fruit. They don't want the seeds. So the animals disperse that seed. So it's hard to tell if the, these, these, some of these are just basically seeds that didn't fall too far from the tree per se or if they're just, if they're offsets. It looks like these, some of these might actually be different plants. But this is certainly just producing offsets. Again, Lofafro Williamsii, you know, wonderful plant, extremely rare. You got the Lofafra diffusa down there, which doesn't contain the mescaline. It's down there in uh, San Luis Potosi and, and Nuevo Leon and what the shit. Let's go look at that uh, kind of serious posa. Okay, so here we go, and this isn't, ah, fuck, Jesus Christ, I just put my hand right on one of those Corophantas. Everything hurts, basically. The Senegalia Berlandiarii is basically tearing into my flesh as I crawl through here. Ow, fuck. Now here you go, there's there's what I told you. Now this is not a massive specimen. Uh, this is a kind of serious right here, but it's you know enough to give you an example of what's going on. Here's another plant, and many cacti do this. Here's another plant that relies on camouflage uh, basically to evade uh, predation, or, or I guess you would call it herbivory by things that want to eat it growing in the desert. And again, when you're growing in the desert, the selective pressures on anything that's green and photosynthesizing uh, are very high. So anything that does not do a good job of properly protecting itself via poisonous alkaloids, secondary chemistry, spines, thorns, uh, or the ability to blend in, basically uh, to mimic uh, your surroundings. And you know, I do the nice botanical camouflage. Anything that doesn't do that is gonna get eaten. You know, you got Aerocarpus scaphorostris down there in the Wave of Leon. Probably one of the best examples of a botanic camouflage. A lot of cacti are very good at doing this. A lot of the Aerocarpus, the Astrophytum, of course, sinks in. And then there's this Echinocereus poselgeri, which just does such a wonderful job of, uh, you know, looking like just a bland, boring stick. Those, you can notice again that, that lichen, this is, and again, this is a lichen, a white color that's a, a lichen. It's a film on these stems. On its bark, and and what this plant, what this cactus is doing, is basically utilizing those 
those spines. Again, in cacti, spines are just modified leaf tissue, and it's using those spines to basically make itself appear white, hide its green color, and blend in to just look like any of the uh, any of these any of the sticks that are just poking up around here. Just dead branches, brambles, and what the shit. See all that stuff? Really easy to, to blend in. And the only reason I know this is here is because I seen it before when I was here eight months ago. And it's a kind of serious postelgari. Interesting thing about these, they got a big ass tuber down there, they got a big ass root down there, and then they got a big, when they do bloom, okay, when they do bloom, it's a gigantic pink, I mean, it's just a basically huge flag. They're so conspicuous, they got very conspicuous flowers, they want to get those pollinators in, they got a big pink perianth, you know, a pretty big flower for what this is. It's actually amazing that something that is so small, so seemingly skinny, could produce such a big ass flower, but again, that vascular tissue is connected to a giant root down there, a thick and bulbous ass root down there. And I think there's a couple native nurseries around here to propagate these. Most cacti, again, are extremely easy to grow for seed from seed, which is so tragic, you know, when you got people poaching. I, my friend Adam Black over there who runs the Peckerwood Gardens, he was just telling me they got uh, a huge shipment of Areocarpus fissuratus, the living rock cactus that was shipped to them or that was sent to them from, uh, I think, customs or somebody confiscated a shipment from Mexico, and some guy had basically dug up, you know, 50, 60 pounds of these extremely rare plants, these extremely rare cacti, and he had a, he dug these all up, and he was selling them on Amazon to some prick in the United States, some creepy cactus collecting bastard, and a lot of those collectors are pretty weird, I hate to say, a lot of them are weird guys, I think the idea of collecting anything can get pretty goddamn weird. But they, you know, basically customs confiscated, you know, all these plants, and uh, and then they gave them uh, to Adam Blake. But just to know, they gave them to this garden, basically. But just to know that someone's out there doing it, and you can go on eBay right now, and you can find some asshole who's selling aerial carpus, and they can't do nothing about it because nobody knows where he is. And when you when you call him out on it, he just says, "I stole it from private land, or it's from my land, whatever." And we were clearing a road or with the shit and blah blah. He's got some bullshit story lined up, but he's selling about. You know, fifteen hundred dollars a cactus at one time. Find that guy and kick him in the nuts for me. I'll uh, I'll buy you a burrito. Okay, well that's nice. Now I got a couple splinters, a couple of spinas I got to pull out of my uh, my flesh later on. Anyway, here's another one. This is pretty common, but I figured I'd show it to you anyways because it's a wonderful goddamn plant. This is Mammillaria hyderi, and it's just a single specimen. But much like that astrophytum over there, they do form these clumps, and they like growing under this uh, this mesquite. This kind of misky, light, light misky canopy. And, you know, you'll look and you'll just see. There's areas, you know, over by over there by, like, Chihuahua Woods and what the shit. You'll just see clumps of these things looking like tribbles on a goddamn ground. Now, this is an interesting plant because I actually have one of these uh, that I got. It was dug up by a feral pig somewhat close to here. Uh, I believe it was about five or six years ago when I first came through here. And uh, it was dug up by a feral pig. And there were gnaw marks on the bottom of it. But I figured, what the shit, it's just going to die. I'll take it anyway. And I took it, and it was in my truck uh, when I had a little altercation uh, with the, one of the mall security security guards uh, known as National Park Police that were in Big Bend National Park. Now, every time I go to national go, go to the National Park, there's cops there. And I met a couple of them, and there's some of them I like. This one was not one that I like. This one was a pretty obnoxious one, and I think he just, he was one of the, like, gung-ho, I mean, literally a mall security guard. The guy should have been, you know, protecting the fucking, uh, 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 the hot topic or whatever from getting robbed by 18 year olds he would have been much more better set up for that than harassing me but he uh, basically saw me he saw me coming back the shirtless tattooed uh, dago that i am just covered in tattoos from the hot spring and he decided he needed to search my car he found that mammillaria hyderi uh in the back of course that mammillaria hyderi doesn't even grow in Big Bend National Park as far as I know. And I had geotag photos showing where I got it. Regardless, he was on a mission to just kind of fuck me in the ass. Uh, do what you got to do, I guess. So he did that. And, uh, you know, he, he tried writing me up, wrote, writing me a ticket for it, saying I was posting it from the park. I was not. I told him the story. I had a picture of the thing where I got it. Uh, he didn't listen. Anyway, I went I went above his head to his superior, showed him the geotag photos. They got the tickets dropped. But meanwhile, the plant had already been confiscated, and I had already... Who? Oh, what is this guy? And I had already left. Does anyone want to steal a cactus? And I had already left. So, uh, you know, I just didn't want to deal with it. It was just kind of a, a bad time. So I came back a year later, and that Mammillaria hyderi 
uh, had been in police lockup with no water, no light for about a year. And uh, they said, okay, uh, Mr. Santor, you can have your stuff back. So I got it back. And, and basically, I put it in the ground when I got back to Oakland, uh, you know, a week or two later. Not in the ground. I put a little pot. And it just started growing again. Oh, no, no worse for the wear. Just started growing again, doing its thing. And, you know, now it's a little bit bigger. It's got flowers and fruits every year with the shit. So cacti, again, are just like little batteries, okay? They can live for a long time. That's, that's the whole purpose of what they do. They can lose their roots completely and just be this, basically just this lump sitting there with no roots. Of course, I don't have any leaves. And you put them back in the soil, you give them warmth, and you give them a little bit of moisture, and they'll send roots out again and just take off, start growing like nothing ever happened. Pretty wonderful organisms. I think that's why people get into them. Anyway, let's see what else we got going on over here. Oh, what a beautiful sunset. Look at that. It's starting to cool off a little bit. Now it's only 95 degrees instead of 101. Here's another nice one, a Castilla erecta. Look at that. You know Castilla morii. If you live in, uh, you know, if you if you live in Arizona or uh, Eastern California, it's of course the crucifixion thorn. Here's another species in a genus, Cimarubaceae. Pretty odd family. Same family as Ailanthus altissima tree of heaven. And again, it's just got very uh, rudimentary leaves down there. You can see they're sessile, and then uh, it's mostly photosynthesizing through its stem. Just saying, don't eat me. Now I want to show you a little bit different of a habitat that that Astrophyta mysterious grows in. So, uh, you know, you can see over here it's a lot more open. Uh, the mesquite's not getting that big. Uh, nothing's really doing that well. And it's because the soil here, for whatever reason, is a little bit more salty. And you know that because you can see the presence of this plant right here, this uh, Saladio, that Varia Texana. Again, it's a member of the Asteraceae discoid flowers. Globose flower heads, globose capitulas, yellow, etc. They bloom around, yeah, I don't know, January, February, and what the shit? Probably more like February. I was here late January, I seen them blooming, but they they go off in more like in February. Now this spot, I remember there being a rather large astrophytum, and uh, it's doing, it's so good at what it does that I can't even see it. It was right here. Hopefully it didn't take a beating from the, from the goddamn mini drought they're in right now. Yeah, I can't even see it. But there was an enormous one right here. Jesus Christ. All right, you know what? I'm going to have to I'm going to have to look a little bit harder. But there's a bunch of them right here. And they're, again, they're, you won't you'll be standing on top of them and you won't even know they're there until you look down. You look down at your boots, you say, "Oh my god, there it is." Okay, anyway, the, the light has dropped to a levels that make it extremely hard to see uh, a plant that is already extremely hard to see, but here's one of them, and unfortunately it don't look good. Here's a nice little astrophytum. And again, we were here back in January. Everything was muddy. I had big ass clobs on my, you know, I gained an extra 10 pounds per boot just from the mud because it was that wet. So just completely different environment. Here it's bone dry and a lot of these things are taking a hit. You could see this thing is probably on its way out. It's not gonna be around uh, for much longer unless they get a rainstorm soon, I guess. But the full exposure, you know, is uh, is really the full exposure and a lack of summer rain. You know, the further east you go from the Mojave, the more summer rain you get. The Mojave is the driest winter or the driest summer desert in uh, in North America. You know, the Chihuahua Desert having a little bit more rain, but they just it's just it's been so dry. And this guy, his color don't look good. His color don't look good. And he's just uh, you you can look at him and he's just super. Super, uh, you know, shriveled up in a mason. Yeah, okay, there we go. That's a little bit better. Anyway, you can see this guy. He's just completely hidden right there. I got to make sure I don't blow his cover. There's another little one right there. So you can see that. I mean, these are doing better than that other one because these, you know, are uh, are hidden a little bit there. There's another little cactus of some sort, possibly a thilo cactus, growing beneath that varia. So they're using the varia again, which is an extremely uh, salt-tolerant, succulent member of the sunflower family to kind of hide out from the sun. Because, again, it's just, you know, for months on end, it's just 105 degrees. And, unfortunately, lately, it's been very bone-dry. But since these are more hidden from 
exposure. And then that one back there that I showed you that was turning orange and shriveling up, these are actually faring all right. And again, I mean, it's just a, a lot of cacti do that. They use, they use camouflage, you know, in addition to spines or, or poisonous alkaloids to just kind of hide out. You know, they're very good. They're adept at camouflage. They're adept at blending into the background. Background mimicking. There you go. There's another one. And it's just not... You know, see that one that's orange back there? That's probably on its way out. This guy's probably going to die over there. But this guy's hanging in. You know, just awaiting a little bit of moisture. You know, it's just uh, just if it would rain a little bit. Everything kind of is just uh, looking like shit. The rain is just taking them back. But obviously you can see how hard it is to find these things. And again, there's that dormant uh, bio crust. Oh, here's a big one. Oh, shit. Oh, this guy don't look good either. Oh, no. Yeah, look, see that orange color? He's on his way out, too. That's probably a 45-year-old, 50-year-old specimen right there, at least. Again, just hiding out beneath this Varia succulent asteraceae. <laughs> Damn. This, you know, the future just doesn't look good for this plant. But luckily, there's people growing them from seed and, uh, and trying to put out new ones. You know, trying to, I guess, reestablish them. They're growing them from seed and putting, you know, I guess doing a form of habitat restoration. Growing them from seed and putting them back in habitat. Trying to get them to a big size. But, I mean, again, I just, uh, it's, it's, it's rather odd. But apparently they're able to tolerate this somewhat salty soil uh, of this, uh, this area. And, again, due to that, uh, you know, I don't know if it's been cleared. Maybe it's been cleared a little bit. But even the, you can see the mesquites that are here are not thriving. You know, it's just very salty soil. And again, the big indicator of that is this plant, that's solid deal. Okay, so anyway, the astrophytum situation is kind of depressing. But regardless, here's another uh, sympatric species that is a species that grows uh, w along with it. This is a hematocanthus set of spinous. You got a nice fruit on there, too. Of course, there you can see that the fruit is inferior. It occurs below the flower right there. It's the dried up, shriveled up flower up top, that little red chili pepper. That plump chili pepper is the fruit. You crack that open, you got tons of little seeds in there. And hopefully some little bird or something helps disperse that thing. Over here you got another species of Echinocereus. And everything just growing on this. Oh, what the shit is this? Is that the Manfreda? I don't know what this is. Oh, it appears to be some monocot of some kind. Anyway. All right, well, that's all I got for you tonight. Cactus Dungeons of South Texas. Pretty nice.